Is that not true? Just think about it. It's the key to why I learn a lot, because I think everything applies. <laughs> so you can walk in and talk to me about anything, and I go, wow, that's interesting. Because sooner or later, somewhere, I'll be able to figure out how to apply it. And that's Ogilvy's point. The third big principle, I think, is that learning by discovery should inform and guide planning, not vice versa. Now, the idea of learning by discovery is very, very important. Go out and do it, and as you're doing it, say to yourself, what am I learning? This is how I'm becoming speaker, by the way. I mean, we're doing it, and then we're checking it out every, every night. We go, now, what do we learn today? It's the opposite of planning, because you see what happens is, and, and here's the, I'm going to see if I can put it up here in a, in a chart real quick. What we tend to say is, okay, we will now have a planning meeting. This is our plan. Now, unfortunately, it turns out reality is outside the plan. What do we normally do? We translate this and lie to ourselves and bring it to here. Right? Because we're going to do our plan. Instead, if you say, I think I'm going in this general direction, but I think I'll figure out if this is what's happening, I think I'll try to learn from what I'm experiencing. It's a very different model. And then I'll do my planning, getting up every morning, trying to think through what did I discover yesterday based on what I was learning. And now I think I'll apply that to rethinking my plan. As opposed to what did I plan, which, means, which is going to make me deny reality and go ahead and do it even if it's smart. Now there's a powerful reason for this, and, and it, this will sur may surprise you. It's, about, it's inside us. Self-interest is real and powerful. Self, you, yourself. I'm talking about you personally in this class. You have a powerful self-interest. One of the things, if you use it as an entrepreneur, is self-interest leads you to learn about your projects so you can achieve your goals. This is self-learning. Boy, I really want to get this done. I better really focus on it. What do I have to learn so I'll be happy because I'll get what I want? But the very same self-interest encourages you to hide from negative information. It is self-protection. The, the, the technical term in psychology is cognitive dissonance. Blocking information which will cause you to have to rethink what you're doing. You buy a dress you really love, except you look horrible in it. You don't want to be told you look horrible in it. Now, you know you should be told you look horrible in it, because you really don't want to look horrible in it. But on the other hand, if they tell you you look horrible in it, think how bad you'll feel about all the money you just spent on this dress that looks horrible. So which do you want? Do you want your friends to say to you, boy, is that horrible? Or do you want your friends to say to you, well, it's an interesting dress. <laughs> do, you, do you see the problem that builds up? I was talking to the guys on that one. Because I know, you know several of you, just think about those long weekends. Now, the point is, when you think about or you, or you get your hair cut or whatever, but what I'm trying to say to you is, you've got to think about Half of you wants to be told the truth even if it's painful because you really want to do better and after all you won't do better if you don't have the truth. The other half of you wants to be protected from the truth if it's painful because you don't like the pain. Bureaucracies and credentialing minimize self-learning and they maximize self-protection. I don't have to learn these things. I'm already a tenured PhD. So I don't care what you think of my class. This is not true of me personally, but this is a, do you, you see what I'm saying? I'm a bureaucrat, so even if I'm an arrogant, stupid bureaucrat, it doesn't matter because you can't fire me. It's too much trouble. On the other hand, because markets won't let you hide from failure, they maximize self-protection and they minimize, I mean, ma they maximize self-learning and they minimize self-protection. In the marketplace, if you lie to yourself, you go broke. People refuse to deal with you. And if, you know, if I'm a bureaucrat and you have to see me to get your driver's license, I can be as nasty as I want to be because you have to see me. But if there are three competitive uh, driver's license offices and they pay the government a little fee to be allowed to issue driver's licenses, you're going to go to the one that's the most efficient, the most courteous, the most available. And now I, the bureaucrat, who is now a contracted out self-serving person, I now have to be nice to you or you won't come to my particular driver. And there's no reason you couldn't issue driver's licenses through three or four or five different companies. Each of them would pay the state a, a fee for issuing the driver's license. Sure, you're seeing lots of different things. So just, but just think about it. you're seeing it in hospitals. I mean, look at the ads you now see. Come to our hospital, you have more fun having a baby with us. <laughs> I mean, I don't know of any woman who's had a baby who thought that was a convincing ad, but, it's, but the principle's right. But, but notice the difference in the two systems. 
in a credentialed bureaucratic structure, if you don't like what I'm doing, tough break, I don't have to learn it because I'm still here. In a market environment, if I don't pay attention and I don't do what the market wants and what the customer wants, I go broke. Now, because of self-learning and self-interest, entrepreneurialism ultimately requires a moral basis. And this is one of the things which I think the, the, the modern age has explicitly failed to attitude of, of the elite culture of the press corps about this whole notion of markets and entrepreneurs and bureaucracy. What they don't get, and frankly this is partly because of, of, of uh, some levels of libertarian thought, what they don't get is that Adam Smith wrote two great books. The more famous is The Wealth of Nations. It is actually his later book, and I suspect in his own mind his less important book. This is the theory of moral sentiments. Let me say up front, it is a lot harder to read than Grinding It Out by Ray Kroc. This is very dense mid-18th century uh, literature. But his argument's very simple, and, and it's well worth you spending a minute on. Smith is a moral philosopher. He's not an economist. Economics, and this goes back to credentialing. In the, er, in, in, in the original world of, of, of learning in the 18th, 19th century where Smith came out, you learned what you needed to learn to write what you needed to write. Only in the modern age, under the, under the influence of the German school of professionalism, do we begin to break it down so that this is an economist, this is a political scientist, this is a historian. And we have all these various subdivisions, which, which are our efforts to break life down so that we can, so we can think we master it by knowing a great deal about one subset. So I know a lot about your wallet as an economist, and I therefore know you. Which is silly. Of course it's not true. Smith, however, was of a different world. Smith was a moral philosopher. He would have thought of economics as, as a subset of moral philosophy. And in the theory of moral sentiments, He's trying to wrestle with why do people behave the way they do. And he comes up with a great concept. It's important, remember the invisible hand is his model in the wealth of nations. That, that the free market guides us to serve the most people in order to make the most money. And if we don't make you happy, you won't pay us, so you won't be happy, and then we won't be happy. So our own self-interest forces us to learn about your self-interest. Which is why the marketplace is the most self-disciplining mechanism ever built. Much more so than a totalitarian police state. Because it is the invisible system which forces me to make me happy to figure out what will make you happy. And since Spielberg did it with Jurassic Park, he got more money, so he's happier. If he produces a bomb, he won't be happy. And even though he might say, I sure wish we could pass a law to make all of you go to my next three movies. As long as it's a free market, he will only succeed by pleasing you. So that's the invisible hand. In volume one, the earlier work, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, what Adam Smith says is, there is a man or woman in the mirror. Every person, except for people who are sociopaths, every person has an invisible mirror in their head, which they look into, and they say, is it right? And they can't avoid it. And they may do wrong, but they know it's wrong. I mean, since we're all weak, we all do wrong. But he says, he builds a, a theory of moral sentiment. He says, the base of society is right and wrong. It's not money. It's not economics. It's right and wrong. And that a healthy society consciously thinks about how do we establish a framework in which the rules tend to favor those who ask that question and listen to it. So it's a framework that favors the honest.